Hey, I hope everybody's doing well. We're still talking about multiple regression, but uh, we're going to finish it up, I think, um, for the most part. So the thing we're going to talk about uh, last but not least is, wow, the bounty that exists with uh, all the stuff that you can do. We haven't, I mean, we haven't even be really begun to scratch the surface. We, we've done a lot, um, for sure, but there's just so much out there. So um, that's what I'm going to try to talk about. In particular, what I'm going to talk about today is what's called... Uh, curvilinear relations. So, C U R V I, curvilinear relations. Curvilinear relations, that's a really broad class of relationships. Um, so far, what we've done is looked at the, the simple, uh, not simple, but multiple linear regression model, right? These were, All our models looked something like this. Um, and if you watch the models video, you can see that we can do a lot, you know, where I explain. You can see that we can do a lot with these. We can talk about baseball. We can talk about uh, cost estimation. We can talk about uh, restaurant food. We can talk about uh, the likelihood that your kid's going to go to Harvard or whatever. You know, any, really, anything you care about, we can use this model to, uh, to talk about. Um, I've already used a few other tips and tricks uh, in, the, uh, in some of the problem sets we've looked at. But, but ultimately, when we built this model, we assumed that y and x had some relationship that looked like this, right? That's y, that's x, um, and the, the underlying relationship looked like this, or looked like this, or looked like this, or something like that, right? That there was some linear relationship. And the truth is that there are lots of things that we think might not be related like this, right? What might they look like? Well, let's imagine that we have something that increases at an increasing rate uh, like the growth of income, human income over time, right? This would be time, in this case. And this would be uh, human productivity, GDP, or gross global product. That is not a good number, a good name for that, I don't think. But this is what that looks like. Nothing, 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 nothing much. Whoa, right? Okay, this is exponential. Something y equals uh, f, some function of x squared. That's what we think, right? That's only one type of thing, right? Let's imagine that there's something that grows quickly and then tails off. Uh, what might this be? I don't know. Market share of a of a new of a new firm, um, like a Firefox, right? Market share for Firefox browser. Maybe it looks like this: it goes up and then it levels off. And this might be y as a function of the log of x. Might look like that. There might be another thing that you know that changes that depending on the level right this would be maybe there's an optimal size for a company and there's profitability or something I'm not even sure what the, what would look like this but something might it might look like this uh, or it goes up and goes down and then goes up again or y is a function of x cubed um, even if it's not that stark you might have something that goes up for a while then it slows down and then it you know you get through some technological barrier and then you push on to more growth um, maybe that that x cubed would solve that problem okay now these are not linear relationships right i mean if we're talking linear relationships we're talking you know these straight lines here not these graphs that i've drawn down here so what can we do should we just give up uh, well the answer is clearly no um we shouldn't we should not just give up um and the other much better answer is that we already know how to solve this problem really pretty easily um we just haven't talked about it yet so we, what we do is we develop what's called the general linear model, which looks like this. So it's not going to look very different. I hope that's okay. I'm not really trying to blow your mind. Just trying to give you some cool tools to use. So we have beta 0 plus beta 1 z1 plus beta 2 z2 plus dot 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 beta p z p plus epsilon. Okay, now each of these independent variables, each of these z's, are functions of x's. Right, so we might still have uh, x1, x2, dot, 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 xk, and then we have p functions of these x's. This generalization allows us to uh, explore a very, very, very large number of potential relationships. Uh, the simplest data, uh, or the simplest version of this, we, is one we've already looked at, right? Where uh, we have 
a straight run line relationship and only one variable. So we have p p equals one and z one equals x one. That's it. that's still this is part of the general model, but this turns into something we've seen. Uh, in particular, this is called a simple first order model with one predictor variable. And it's going to look familiar, I believe, because it's just the simple linear model. It's a special case of this new, more general model. So y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x 1 plus epsilon. OK, clearly not mind-blowing stuff just yet. Well, we can look at a second order model with one predictor variable. And this is new. Second order model with one predictor variable. And this means we, once again, we only have one, one, uh, one x. We're going to put it in here. Beta 1, x 1, plus beta 2, that's a beta, beta 2, x 1 squared plus epsilon. And now we've just modeled, uh, and we've, just, we've introduced another function of x1. We've just modeled the nonlinear relationship between y and x. What else? Well, we can add additional variables. Let's, we have a second order model with two predictor variables. And this is, it gets, grows big fast. Uh, two predictor variables. This is y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x1 squared plus beta 4 x2 squared plus beta 5 x1 x2 plus epsilon. Okay, now in this model, uh, z5 is equal to x1, x2, and it accounts for uh, potential effects of the two variables acting together, right? You can look at, uh, you can use this to determine, you know, if, uh, I don't know, if you're, if the return to education changes with age. If x1 is age and x2 is education, you can find out, well, maybe education is useful, but the value of it doesn't kick in until you hit, I don't know, your, your late 30s or something, when you finally, you know, I don't know, you've crossed some threshold. Or maybe it's most useful when you first get out of college, and then after time, it tapers off, right? Your education doesn't matter so much because on-the-job training matters. This is called an interaction term. Uh, I'm going to pause for a, sec to get my, for a second to get my pen back. All right, so again, this is an interaction term. Uh, and we use these a lot to try to figure out if uh, two thing, if something has a different effect um, or if two things have a, a different effect if you put them together. Okay, now these are all looking at things we can do on the right-hand side, but we can do a lot uh, with uh, transforming our explanatory or our, uh, our dependent variable as well. Um, so the, yeah, let's take a look at what this might look like. Well, one thing we just talked about not long ago is the problem of heteroscedasticity, um, which is a fancy name from Greek roots for unequal variance, meaning that our error terms are not the same. They depend on uh, they depend on x in some way. Um, well, what we can do, one way to solve this problem is to in, in, uh, replace y in our model with y tilde, y squiggle, which is log of y. And that, that can a lot of times solve the problem. It's called a logarithmic transformation logarithmic transformation. And you've probably seen the LN before. It might be a while since you've looked at it, since you know what it means. Uh, it means, well, you take the natural you take the natural log. Uh, and essentially, it's saying, um, what power do you have to raise e2 to get y? Um, I recommend looking up the Wikipedia page if you want to know about natural logs. We'll take the natural log of y. Um, but it manages to change this problem into a problem in which we use uh, growth. It's very commonly used in economics. Um, because a lot of our variables of interest, like income or population, tend to grow. Uh, sales grows. Another one you might use is what's called the reciprocal transformation, where you, instead of using y, uh, you use 1 over y. So we replace y with, uh, with its reciprocal, with its multiplicative reciprocal, with 1 over y. 
and you use that as the dependent variable. Okay, and those are just some examples of the things you can do. There's really a lot you can do. Um, and so, as it turns out, there's really not that much that you can't do with this approach with the, the general linear model. The way you actually run this stuff is just like you did before. You create these variables, you put them in Excel, and you run with it. Um, uh, clearly, you know, we showed how to look at um, x1 and x1 squared. Uh, you can also look at, you know, log y equals uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 log of x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus epsilon. So some you can measure some of your dependent variables and your independent variables as logs. Um, even more obscure stuff, right? So let's say, uh, let's go down a page so I can play with this a little. Let's say we have y equals um, beta 0 times x1 to the beta 1 times x2 to the beta 2, where we think it has kind of this obscure relationship times epsilon. Well, it turns out that if you take the log of both sides, uh, this turns into log of y equals log of beta 0 x1 beta 1 to the beta 1 power x2 to the beta 2 power times epsilon, uh, which is equal to um, log of beta 0 plus beta 1 log of x1 plus beta 2 log of x2 plus epsilon and log of y is still over here. Suddenly this becomes something that's kind of familiar, right? Now instead of beta 0 we have log of beta 0, which you can just redefine beta 0 squiggle, and y squiggle over here. And now you just plug in your y squiggle and your, you know, your log of x1, your log of x2 into your regression, your log y, and it tells you some stuff that you wanted to know. I mean, you can, you can figure out what these betas are in this relationship. Essentially, we use this one kind of a lot. Um, you can look at fractional relationships. If y is equal to 1 over beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus epsilon, well, then 1 over y, you do the reciprocal transform, and you have fairly straightforward uh, multiple regression model. You just need to change your dependent variable. One very common one that economists, economists recognize um, would be this. Let's say that we have uh, output, production, production model. We want to model how much output you're going to produce. You have Q is quantity, that's your output. And that's equal to some technological factor, A, times L to the alpha, where L is the units of labor. Maybe it's hours, man hours you have hired. And K is uh, capital. You can also measure those in dollars, in terms of dollars of labor and dollars of capital. K to the beta. Um, this is called a Cobb-Douglas production function. And this comes right out of theory. And a lot of, a lot of the stuff you're going to want to look at when you start using multiple regression, you want to see if you can estimate some stuff that's going on. Just think about the, you know, the way in which you think stuff works. This is one way that economists think stuff works. So that usually alpha and beta, alpha, you can either assume that alpha plus beta are equal to one, or you can test that. Um, and that's constant returns to scale. You can test to see whether you have increasing or decreasing returns to scale. Uh, less than one or greater than one, you can test all sorts of that stuff. Um, you can also see what the share, this alpha is going to be the share of output that you can ascribe to labor. And the share of uh, beta is the share of capital that you can ascribe to, uh, the share of output you can ascribe to capital. So if you want to, you know, lot, we have lots of reasons to think that maybe where labor is cheaper, um, you're going to have more labor and you're going to have less capital. Um, and labor is going to be more responsible for output. So you can test that. Well, you could test this um, if we could turn this into something we can use multiple regression for. It doesn't look anything like what we've used before. That said, we can you know, use some simple algebraic tools to try to figure out if we can solve this. So let's take the log of both sides. You get log of Q equals log of A, L to the alpha, K to the beta, which is equal to log of A plus, because you can do this with anything time things are multiplied together, you can add their logs. It was uh, log of L to the alpha plus log of K to the beta. And anytime something's raised to it, you can multiply that by the log. So this turns into log of A plus alpha log L plus beta log K. All right, now we can throw this into a, our, our situation, into our, uh, we can redefine some stuff. Um, let's call our uh, dependent variable log q, let y equal log q. 
um, and we're going to let uh, beta 0 equal log of a, let beta 1 equal alpha, beta 2 is going to be beta, Uh, x1 is log L, x2 is log K, and then this just turns into y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. Now if we think that we have some measurement error or some kind of un unobserved stuff, we can just throw that in as an error term. Are these uh, going to be, you know, are these assumptions going to be valid? Well, we can, we don't, we don't know. We can look at the residual plots and try to see. Um, we might want to include other stuff if we think that there might be a reason to think it, it would not be. But certainly what we can try to do is come up with estimates then, because this is going to be over here. It's going to be the return, the share of output uh, to labor. And this is going to be the share of output to capital. And this is going to be the result of technology, productivity. Um, so we can estimate that stuff. You throw a bunch of different countries in there, try to estimate that. And so what we do is we take theory, and you can plug it into multiple regression to try to solve the problem. Um, we, we, you can do cost estimation the same way, right? We did that before. Um, that might be a little bit easier, where you just have um, cost equals the fixed cost plus um, unit cost or total cost is over here times uh, production volume and uh, this is your variable this is your x is production volume total cost is your y and you can estimate your fixed costs and your unit costs um, but if you think you have a more complicated uh, uh, cost function you can throw that in there you can try to figure out what that more complicated cost function is. You can use a cost function that includes labor and capital in there. Uh, just crack open a principal's textbook and, uh, and get some useful knowledge there. Anyway, um, there's a lot of stuff here, clearly. Um, and the linear linearizing these relationships is relatively straightforward. Um, we haven't had to... Economists, econometricians, statisticians, uh, applied statisticians, have not very often had to rely on some other form of statistical analysis other than multiple regression whenever we want to estimate uh, a relationship like this. Clearly, sometimes you don't need to take a theoretical model. You can just use a reduced form model if you just want to test to see if there's a relationship. Um, if you're just testing differences in conditional means, that's fine. Um, but if you have a good reason to think that uh, that there there is some formula like uh, Cobb-Douglas or uh, any of these, right, some, some inverse relationship between two things like this one um, or some, you know, log relationship any and all of these, you can use a little bit of math. Consult, you know, consult somebody and ask them for help getting in there, or do it yourself, and and you have the data. You can run it through, run it through the model, and, and see what you get. Anyway, there's a, there's a lot we can do with uh, multiple regression, uh, and and uh, using reciprocal transform, log logarithmic transform is big. Using that um, to try to solve heteroscedasticity, just using a, thinking about it generally, thinking about about all, how you can take how you think the world works and, and, and turn it into a linear model uh, is very useful. I hope that has been of interest and of use to you. Um, we've been using these a, f a fair bit in a couple of the practice problems, so I recommend that you watch those videos if you are if you want more information or are having any trouble. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, drop a comment, econDRD, my YouTube account, or uh, shoot me an email at jjdelaney at ualr.edu, and I will be glad to get back to you. Thanks, guys. Talk to you again soon. Bye.